The following is an excerpt from the novel Promo Cowboy by Barry Fitzsimmons, read by the author. Chapter 16. It's near 6P, and just like Belinda promised, Modest John gets me on the horn. First off, talking up all the promos me and Joe been working on, how they're awful colorful and classy, and how he'd like to someday be a promo writer just like old cowboy. I tell him how he's in for a life of drought, starvation, and pain, like them pitiable Red Sox fans. Only then I step off and say how I'm just joshing. It's a fine career path, long as he's got the creative chops and ain't afraid to bare his soul for the world to reject on a whim. Modest John don't backpedal one bit. I can do that. I think, hmm. Then I ask where this mystery meeting with Belinda's gonna be at. Some old haunt, he says, smart aleck lack. Hell's Kitchen? That sounds like a nice restaurant. Hell's Kitchen ain't no restaurant, son. A neighborhood's what it is, a destination even. Got a real singular charm, it does, and some fine eating and drinking establishments. That's my neck of the woods, you know. John makes it sound like he wouldn't get caught quick or dead in such a place. Guess folks that are new to this city got a lot to learn. Anyhow, that boy better make a better promo producer than he does a secretary, on account of there's some confusion over what time this meeting's at. She's been waiting there for an hour, he says. Shoot, John, then how come you didn't call me till just now? His voice cracks some. I'm just doing what I'm told, sir. Maybe she wanted some time alone. I don't know. Don't make sense, that. Please don't tell Belinda I screwed up. You ain't screwed up, not if you're doing what you're told. I just... I can't afford to end up on her bad side. Makes two of us, Modest John. Remember that. All he's got for me is an address. On ninth it is, and it don't ring no bells. Of course, I never was a man for numbers. I give old Joe the salute, and I hit the streets. And once I'm outside, I get a wild hair to stop home and freshen up. Heck, I'm already late, and it's only about an extra block, going west past ninth. And once I'm through that door to my hovel, I move awful quick. Dropping my satchel, hanging my hat, hitting that power button on my TV and ducking into my washroom to splash my face. That tube comes up on the channel I left it on, and I hear the voice of old Mike J on the tray. Mike Jenkins, that is, on Channel 3 News, my longtime client that I'm loyal to even when I ain't working there. Of course, I ain't got no cable nor satellite, and of all the local stations in New York, the tray comes in the cleanest, so I stick with it. Anyhow, that Mike, an institution in this town he is, he's raving over one breaking story or another. Sounds like a dead body's turned up downtown, a likely homicide, and the murder weapon's videotape. At least that's what I think I hear on account of my washroom water taps running at the same time, and it squeaks something awful. Another day in this town, another man killed, I think, and I walk over with my wet face and listen to that old silver-haired Mike who's barking away about how folks shouldn't touch that dial and his producers right now scrambling to get cameras down to the scene. He's promising top reporters, team coverage, the whole nine, short of solving the crime itself, that is, if indeed it is a crime. I switched that channel anyhow, a few times, and sure enough, all them other newscasts already got live remotes out front of some banged up old tenement that's got what looks like Chinese spray paint on the walls. Them reporters are all crying out the latest injustice upon humanity, that being the alleged murder of a fella that got found by his landlady, bound and gagged he was, with his neck all wrapped up in videotape. Guess I heard it right the first time after all. Funny how them reporters all look like they're amidst a snowstorm, thanks to that bum signal. I tune it back to the tray, and they're still in the studio, and Mike's still going on about how his top reporters flee into the scene, with a police escort even. Guess all hell's busting loose in that newsroom, not to mention promo land. Makes me glad it does, how it ain't none of my affair, on account of I'm right now working for TV station. Fact, I figure I don't need to hear no more and I switch that TV off. Itching to head out I am, only I see how the light's blinking on my answering machine, so I come down hard on that button with my fist, like I always do, only too hard I guess, on account of it plays back awful distorted like. Of Course, there ain't no mistaking the voice on that tape. 
It's my old friend and client, Jim Jones, from Channel 3, no less, the very same station I just turned off on my own TV. Left me two messages, Jim has. First one's over that same month-long slot of daily topicals he called about last week. Already turn you down, I bark out. Second one plays back even slower, giving his voice a devilish quality. A drunken devil from the sound of it, and forgetful. He tells how he's sorry I ain't gotten back to him, and he guesses him and me won't be making promo magic after all, like we done so many years, going back through wars and famines and sundry disasters, etc, etc, etc. Another time, old friend, I say out loud, and I yank my door open, and just for I'm about to grab my dark brown and set her low, like usual, I catch sight of my dress hat, that bone-colored Stetson with the black cowhide trim and turquoise accents. I make the switch, thinking, bet this'll sure impress Belinda. The fit on that hat's still a bit tight, but I hit the streets anyhow, and I light up. Tastes like a menthol on account of I brush my teeth. And when I get to 9th, I head north, figuring Belinda's old haunts in Up Avenue place round near that admixture saloon. Heck, maybe it's even the same joint. Folks in our trade been going there for years. Wouldn't mind locking eyes again with that lovely barmaid Cassie James, maybe even having a word or two. Of course, I ain't sure what I'd say. Truth is, that woman scares the daylights out of me. Anyhow, I start looking for the right numbers, only it turns out I got them crossed, and I surely misjudge Belinda's taste in drinking establishments. I end up doubling back down the avenue, and I know the place all right, only guess I didn't ever know the address, and me a paying customer all these years.